BestBookBits.com presents In Praise of Idleness by Bertrand Russell. Published in 1935 and weighing 242 pages, the collection includes essays on subjects on sociology, philosophy, and economics. In the eponymous essay, Russell argues that if labor was equitably shared out amongst everyone, resulting in shorter workdays, unemployment would decrease, and human happiness would increase due to the increase in leisure time, further resulting in increased involvement in the arts and sciences. The written summary can be found on our website, bestbookbits.com. So without further ado, I bring the book summary of In Praise of Idleness. But in countries which do not enjoy Mediterranean sunshine, idleness is more difficult, and a great public propaganda will be required to inaugurate it. I hope that after reading the following pages, the leaders of the YMCA will start a campaign to induce good young men to do nothing. If so, I shall not have lived in vain. If he spent his money, say, in giving parties for his friends, they, we may hope, would get pleasure. And so all those upon whom he spent money, such as the butcher, the baker, and the bootlegger. The morality of work, the notion that everyone ought to work to earn their life, is the morality of slaves. And the modern world has no need of slavery. Leisure is essential for civilization, and in former times, leisure for the few was only rendered possible by the labors of the many. But their labors were valuable, not because their work is good, but because the leisure is good. And with modern technique, it would be possible to distribute leisure justly without injury to civilization. The war showed conversely that by scientific organization of production, it is possible to keep modern populations in fair comfort on a small part of the working capacity of the modern world. If at the end of the war, the scientific organization, which has been created in order to liberate men from fighting and munition work, had been preserved, the hours of work had been cut down to four, all would have been well. Because work is a duty and a man should not receive wages in proportion to what he has produced, but in proportion to his virtue as exemplified by his industry. The wise use of leisure, it must be conceded, is a product of civilization and education. A man who has worked long hours all his life will be bored if he becomes subtly idle. But without a considerable amount of leisure, a man is cut off from many of the best things. There is no longer any reason why the bulk of the population should suffer this deprivation. Only a foolish asceticism, usually vicarious, makes us continue to insist on work in excessive quantities now that the need no longer exists. The butcher who provides you with the meat and the baker who provides you with the bread are praiseworthy because they are making money. But when you enjoy the food they have provided, you are merely frivolous, unless you eat only to get strength for your work. We think too much of production and too little of consumption. We think too much of production and too little of consumption. One result is that we attach too little importance to enjoyment and simple happiness, and that we do not judge production by the pleasure that it gives to the consumer. It is an essential part of any such social system that education should be carried further than it usually is at present, and should aim, in part, at providing taste, which would enable a man to use leisure intelligently. The pleasures of urban populations have become mainly passive, seeing cinemas, watching football matches, listening to the radio, and so on. This results from the fact that they are active, energies are fully taken up with their work. If they had more leisure, they would again enjoy pleasures in which they took an active part. Without the leisure class, mankind would never have emerged from barbarism. At present, the universities are supposed to provide, in more of a systematic way, what the leisure class provide accidentally and as a byproduct. In a world where no one is compelled to work more than four hours a day, every person possessed of scientific curiosity will be able to indulge in it, and every painter will be able to paint without starving, however excellent his pictures may be. Young writers will not be obliged to draw attention to themselves by a sensational pot boilers with a view to acquiring the economic independence needed for monumental works, for which when the time at last comes, they will have lost the taste 
and the capacity. At least 1% will probably devote the time not spent in professional works to pursuits of some public importance, and since they will not depend upon these pursuits for their livelihood, their originality will not be unhampered, and there will be no need to conform to the standards set by the elderly pundits. Good nature is, of all moral qualities, the one the world needs most. And good nature is the result of ease and security, not of a life of arduous struggle. Hitherto, we have continued to be as energetic as we were before the machines. In this, we have been foolish, but there is no reason to go on being foolish forever. And that's a wrap of In Praise of Idleness by Bertrand Russell. Subscribe to our channel now for future summaries and check out our website, bestbookbits.com, for the written summary and audio. To buy the book, use the website store where you'll find this book and hundreds more to browse and purchase. Thanks for watching, and I hope you learned a thing or two about In Praise of Idleness. Have yourself an amazing day and stay tuned for more.